Okay, the last panel of the day is dedicated to, uh, of course, very important topic in football. And it's about uh, transfer and the new challenges uh, FIFA is facing in the field of transfer. The panel will be moderated by James Kitching, who is alumni from the 12th edition, if I'm correct. And uh, he will introduce the member of the panel. So James, you have the floor. Okay. Yeah. okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, CIS, for uh, the invitation introduction. Um, before the panel comes, uh, also I'd like to welcome the alumni uh, that aren't from Zurich and the guests that aren't from Zurich here to Zurich. And if there's anything I can do to help, uh, just let me know. Um, it's a pleasure here to uh, be here with three very esteemed guests. Before I call them to the floor, we just want to give a short uh, two-minute introduction to the football transfer system. It's late in the day. Everyone is... Uh, um, everyone's uh, had their lunch and their afternoon break, and it's maybe nice just to uh, just to recap the topic before the amazing discussion. So as you all know, FIFA launched its vision and mission last year, and if we move to the next slide, you'll see that the the primary um, the primary goal or one of the uh, it's up here. Perfect. Thank you very much. So one of the primary goals of the football transfer system is to modernise the football rate of FIFA. Sorry, is to modernise the football regulatory framework, and one of the core four areas of that is to reform the transfer system. So what that has meant uh, since 2018 is a number of different things. So what you see on the screen here are the, the principles that undermine or under, underpin how FIFA views the transfer system and how it defines what we regulate and the policy areas we work on. Um, for those that work in football, you would have heard of many of these things or seen many of these things. And uh, all of these things go into how we actually decide uh, how we actually decide what goes into the regulations which govern the football transfer system. So since 2018, more or less, uh, was the first uh, instance when FIFA actually sat down with its stakeholders and decided these are the areas that we need to look in. But right before then, we undertook a few different things as well. We introduced, if I'm not mistaken, what was called narrow issues. So for those that uh, are aware, uh, in 2017, we made some very important changes to the regulations to protect football players. And subsequently, after that, we followed a process whereby a number of different packages have, have been worked on. And this slide basically describes the topics which our guests are going to talk about today. So the key ones, FIFA Clearinghouse, football agents, loans, training rewards. Last year, we worked on football coaches and female players. And minors, there was a minor amendment, and then in 2021, uh, we've been working on these topics. So as you can see, all very interesting, topical, uh, I like to think sexy things, uh, which, govern, uh, which govern how football is regulated off the pitch, uh, which is what we will be talking about today. Uh, and we move forward on the footballs. Very quickly, just to give some context, when we're talking about football agents, here what you see on the screen in front of you are the numbers which come from FIFA's reports through the FIFA transfer matching system. Uh, this is the amount of money which is paid to football agents through the football transfer system. In 2020, there was 496 million uh, US dollars which was paid to football agents uh, through the international football transfer system and declared in FIFA TMS. When we talk about when we talk about the amounts of money paid to football agents versus the amounts of money paid to clubs that train players, when you look at the ratio, uh, for every one US dollar of training rewards, so that is uh, payments which are due to clubs which train players, for every one US dollar declared to FIFA as was paid, $9.50 was paid to a football agent. So this is one of the things and one of the reasons why FIFA is looking to reform this area. Secondly, as you or may be aware or, or would be aware, FIFA is introducing a clearinghouse. Uh, that clearinghouse is going to have the task of automating the payment of what I just referred to before, those training rewards. In the 2020 uh, calendar year in the football transfer system, 282 million US dollars was due to clubs for training players based on FIFA regulations. 
And as was declared to us, only approximately 50 million was actually paid. So there's a $230 million gap there, which the clearinghouse is seeking to fix when it comes into, into fruition. This is the timeline of the clearinghouse, which I'll let Emilio talk about in a minute, and also the timeline of the third reform package, which Emilio will talk about in a minute. So just to provide the context to everybody, uh, the final topic uh, on the agenda, which was actually adopted in May, and there was also an announcement today, so exclusive just for you, uh, the Football Tribunal, a new dispute resolution and application deciding body has also been launched uh, by FIFA, which encompasses the existing uh, the existing uh, dispute resolution chamber and player status committee, which now becomes a player status chamber, and also an agents chamber, which will eventually come into force to decide cases involving football agents and their clients, or maybe disputes between football agents themselves. So there's a very rudimentary graphic, which unfortunately doesn't fit the uh, resolution of the screen. So I apologize for that, but the football tribunal itself will be uh, officially launched very soon. And I'll let uh, the guys here talk about that. So that's the context, and I am very, very excited to uh, introduce our three guests today. Uh, I think I'll, uh, I'll have to call up first uh, the FIFA Chief Legal and Compliance Officer, uh, Emilio Garcia Silvero, um, up to the stage. Thank you, Emilio. Please. Uh, and secondly, I'd like to call up the managing director and I believe second edition FIFA master alumni uh, and a friend of ours, uh, sports, international sports lawyer, Paolo Lombardi. Paolo. And I know I'm going to get this wrong, apologies, uh, Raffaele, but Raffaele, who is, I believe, the head of the observatory of the FIFA CIS. So Raffaele Poli to the stage. Thank you. And so here, I think we have a really excellent panel where I have uh, someone from inside FIFA who can tell us all the gossip, someone from the market who can tell us everything that FIFA is doing wrong, and, uh, and then and someone from a research and academic perspective who, again, can tell us everything that FIFA is really doing wrong. So um, first, though, I'd like to hand over to Emilio. And, and Emilio, just you know, in terms of the context of what's been described, you know, discuss the reform process and maybe what FIFA's key goals are for the you know, next 12, 24 months. First of all, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, or good evening, wherever you are, those who are following us on, on FIFA.com. It's a great pleasure to be here, particularly with our friends, colleagues, and brothers from the CIS. Thanks for inviting me to attend this uh, roundtable. Well, the transfer reform process or system is, is something that, as you just explained, we started in October 2018, following the constitution of the FIFA Football Stakeholders Committee. Um, it's a complex process, but very exciting, I have to admit. So um, I tend to say that uh, you can divide uh, FIFA uh, timeline over the last 30 years uh, when it comes to the transfer regulations, the transfer system in three different packages. The, the first one is what I call imposition. So, you know, we had uh, a, a ring and we tried to govern all with our ring. So, you know, we think about the rules, we refer the rules to our committees, and we impose the rules. This was the system until 2001. Uh, in 2001, as you probably know, uh, FIFA reached an agreement with the European Commission, and the system changed. Uh, from 2001 until 2015, 2016, the system is based or was based on collaboration. So FIFA was more open, uh, trying to engage with the so-called football stakeholders. But in the end, we retain the final decision. As from the constitution in 2016 of the Football Stakeholders Committee and the whole reforms transfer system, right now we are more close to a CBA, collective bargain, bargaining agreement system, rather than other things. So, you know, if we want to modify, to change, to amend something, we are always with our football stakeholders, with the clubs, with the leagues, uh, uh, with the member associations and the confederations. And this is the system. That's why, you know, we started in 2018. It's challenging because it's not just applying your, your, the, the, the power of your ring. It's a collaboration system. But I think that we have made a lot of progress since then. 
you briefly de described uh, some of these proposals, the clearinghouse, agents, uh, narrow issues. So we are more or less comfortably satisfied with the outcome, but there, there are still much to do. Uh, uh, as you know, as we know, we are working on three, four different areas right now, minors, squad sizes, transfer windows, and the so-called financial regulations. This is the last and hopefully the final package of the transfer reform uh, uh, system, and we are moving forward. So in the next uh, uh, six months, two months, we need to see uh, the agent regulations in place. And at the same time, we hope that we can start operating the so-called FIFA Clearing House. For me, these are the two key topics in the next six, 12 uh, months. Thanks, Mila. Great. And uh, Paolo, you know, someone in the, the market for such a long time, first you worked at FIFA and then, you know, you've gone to the market, you've worked with, uh, I think, what Emilio called the ring, and then also uh, the next step. And then, and then now you see this step since yeah. we started the transfer reform at FIFA. What, what for you has been the impact from a practical perspective for, for your clients, for you as a, a lawyer and, and, and for the market itself? Well, um, there's been a lot of uh, adjustment to, for, for our clients. We work mainly with clubs um, across Europe and, and outside. And I would say that uh, um, they needed a lot of um, hand-holding when it comes to um, becoming... Uh, familiar with uh, with with the changes, I am. Um, I would like to also mention that uh, Emilio presented uh, these changes uh, at our Edinburgh Sports Conference uh, two years ago, in uh, in uh, in Edinburgh. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and just to give you a couple of examples, uh, I would say in the last year or so one of the things that one of the reforms the changes that has impacted our work most is this the um, system of the so-called fifa proposals the fact that in order to accelerate the pr proceedings that uh, you know were stockpiling or uh, you know they were piling up uh, on uh, my former colleagues' desks, uh, the, the system that allows the FIFA administration to, uh, in certain circumstances of, of contractual clarity, uh, to issue a proposal which becomes binding if it's not uh, challenged, that has had an impact on, on our work. And I'd like to remember specifically one case that we had in which there was a proposal concerning uh, training compensation. And um, this became uh, binding upon the parties because one of the parties did not engage with the process. So did not reject, did not request the opening of regular uh, ordinary proceedings. Um, this was later on challenged by this party and um, they went to CAS. This was the first case um, in which I was um, fortunate enough to be on the same side as, uh, <laughs> as, uh, as FIFA and uh, uh, Miguel Littard and his uh, team did a terrific job. And um, well, we won the case uh, for ourselves and for FIFA. <laughs> <laughs> so you're welcome. And uh, send, Cass. Send, send the invoice. <laughs> <laughs> this, and, is, this is part of the training compensation that you owe us, no? Yeah, exactly. So for the years that you spent here. Absolutely. So, so absolutely. we settled. I'm just the giving back. Settled. <laughs> exactly. I'm just giving back. I'm just giving back. And um, no, Cass, uh, we. Uh, I thought this was a very important decision because CAS confirmed in and what you can say it was an unprecedented decision um, that the system works. Uh, there were some adjustments and FIFA did <laughs> just to uh, some glitches in, in the system and in the latest, um, well, the one before this one, um, the, the latest version of the regulations, this, this bug was fixed, uh, and now the system works pretty well, not only for training compensation and solidarity contribution, but also for uh, the so-called uh, player status cases, transfer-related cases. So if there's a prima facie clarity, if there's, if there's prima facie contractual uh, clarity, then, uh, of course, they, 
um, uh, the administration can issue uh, uh, proposals that uh, become binding. The other issue, again, with um, uh, solidarity contribution is the application of it in, in, uh, at domestic level. And the fact that the interplay with domestic uh, regulations, for example, uh, in Italy, one of the most common uh, uh, ways of transferring players is uh, loan with compulsory uh, uh, purchase option, so to speak. And um, in that case, too, FIFA um, issued recently a decision uh, in relation to the fact that um, because the option was compulsory upon a certain condition occurring, and this condition occurred prior to the uh, new uh, domestic solidarity contribution system coming into force on the 1st of July, then uh, solidarity did not apply to that specific transfer which applied prior to that. Um, although ultimately, the purchase option would, the, 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 the permanent registration took only place in September 2020. I could also mention the, the new way of calculating uh, uh, training compensation on a calendar year basis as opposed to uh, 1st of July to 30th of June and, uh, and a, number, a number of those. But it's, it's uh, this, this in a nutshell, is what, what um, I would like to mention uh, the, the, it, that had a significant impact in the last 12 months of, of uh, you know, being a foot soldier in, uh, in the in transfer market arena. Great. Didn't sound negative to me, so we're doing a good job. So uh, thanks, Paolo. And Raffaele is, uh, you know, an academic researcher and observer looking at what we're doing from a completely different perspective from us. I mean, what, what are your insights on how the, the transfer reform process has, uh, has impacted everyone over the last five years? And, and is there anything that you can tell us about that? Yeah, for sure. I think uh, from the point of view of the Football Observatory, we are very interested in data. And from that perspective, I think uh, transparency has increased, which is very useful for the industry uh, at a wall. Uh, but also for FIFA itself, I think a few years ago you wouldn't be able to present the figures you just presented before about the ratio between the intermediary fees or training rewards or the percentage of solidarity contribution that are effectively paid to club. This is, I think, uh, a, a big step forward because when we started at the Football Observatory already in 2005, FIFA wasn't publishing anything about uh, transfers uh, even they are still uh, not in the digital world or, or was we, through fax, for example. So there was a, a delay. Sports, uh, even for a, such a big organization, uh, which had already the means, Paolo, you worked at the time uh, also uh, at FIFA, uh, there, there were sh things, I think, that should have done before. But still... It was done. It was done, I'm not sure fully, because you said already clearing out, uh, we are in expectation to implement. It's not easy because of the new approach, also consulting all stakeholders. Uh, it has advantages for sure, but also it restricts you in taking decisions. Uh, but uh, this is the new world, I think, is the only way of doing anyway. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of expectations from uh, uh, from this new trend of transparency, tracking not only the players, even though even the players is difficult to track in the record or where they did they play uh, as a youth uh, to, to know with certainty uh, who has the right to get the compensation, training compensation, solidarity in itself is a problem. And the money, of course, not only tracking the players, but the money, because uh, as I will probably develop later, there is also a problem in tracking the money. There is a lot of money involved and we need for more transparency and we need to come back to the principles of the transfer system, uh, which you mentioned or, or, already uh, also before, uh, in, in particular rewarding the training work of the clubs because now it is like if everyone has a right, a legitimate, thinks to have a legitimate right to have a, a, a share of the pie of the transfers. 
not only agents, players, friends of players, relatives, everybody, from the point of view what uh, what the club say also, they are all claiming for this money and, uh, and dreaming of this money, but FIFA has to, to, to remind that uh, this is not the, pre the, the primary goal of the transfer system, of course. No, no, very good points, I think. Uh, thank you. Emilio, uh, the tough one now. You've seen everything on the, the screen, all of the projects that we have to deliver in the, in the, you know, the next few years, and you're smiling very politely. Um, what do you think will be the biggest challenges you will face? What are the, the issues that keep you awake at night and, uh, and give you a, a cold sweat? What is, what's, what's coming? I tell you, I sleep very well. So <laughs> every day from 9.30 until 6 o'clock in the morning, I go bed very early. So, you know, uh, even though uh, I have to admit that we, 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 we are facing challenges and, and very nice challenges. No? But I think that uh, Rafael is right. One of the key challenges for us in the future will be to clean the transfer system. And that's the main goal of the FIFA Clearing House. And that's why we are launching these projects, because we, we, we need to put the money into the machine and we need to clean the, the, the whole transfer system. So with the clearing house first, we are going to guarantee that the money is finally distributed. So training compensation and solidarity will end up in the hands of the right individuals, right clubs. That's the most important thing, one of the fundamental aspects of the clearing house. And of course, the second aspect, vital aspect of the project is cleaning slash compliance. So right now, as you know better than me, you know, we have a transfer with the Club A, Club B, then, you know, the money goes from Club B to our agent, and then the agent pays in a different account in a different country. So Paolo knows well this very well, this part of the day-to-day -day activity in football. With the Clearing House, we are going to avoid this. So Club A will pay to the FIFA Clearing House. FIFA Clearing House will do, as we discussed uh, for more than two hours today, all the compliance matters, and we, the FIFA Cleaning House, will pay this amount to the club, to the bank account of the club, under the jurisdiction of the club in the same country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, for me, the first uh, big challenge that uh, we will face in the next six, 12 months is start operating the FIFA Cleaning House. That is a big project from different angles. No, So it's not only what you mentioned again, so data, collecting data, from all around the world. I, I see Kimberly here, so the former manager of FIFA TMS, she started the project. So, you know, that's something that we don't speak up, but we spent more than three years trying to use the Connect ID, ITMS, TMS, so collecting data. And we know that in the beginning, the data will not be perfect or 100% accurate, and we will face problems. But, you know, we are here to solve these problems. And the second aspect is the clearing house itself. So the banking issues, so the license, everything around. So the corporate aspect of the FIFA clearing house, that is also very challenging. Anyway, you know, we are moving forward and we expect to start operating in, in, in 2022. The second big uh, box uh, might be, would be agents. So we are also working on this project since two years ago, we have some decisions passed by the FIFA Football Stakeholders Committee, means FIFA, clubs, leagues, players, MAs, confederations. We also have decisions passed by the FIFA Council with some principles. And now we are in the last phase of implementing these decisions. Um, the consultation process, the, the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, I cannot remember. So consultation process with MAs, with agents, with confederations, with clubs, and um, if everything goes in the right direction, the FIFA Council should approve the new football agent regulations uh, uh, very soon. Mm -hmm. So between 2021, 2022, the, the regulations should be out. But you sleep all right with all of this. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, no problems. De definitely. So yeah. only when Depor okay. loses, you know, uh, I have a feeling for the rest. I'm fine. Deportivo La Coruña. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Perfect. So you, you, you don't need to say Deportivo La Coruña. If you say Depor, so everybody knows that I'm talking about Deportivo de La Coruña. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, we know. <laughs> Black and white colors behind you. <laughs>
<laughs> Perfect. Uh, so, Paolo, from the outside, again, as, uh, as someone that works in the market along with the clients, most of the clubs, what do you think are going to be the, the biggest issues that FIFA is going to face to, you know, mm -hmm. implement the systems and the, the changes that it's wanting to implement? I mean, Emilio has just spoken about the clearinghouse and agents, which will obviously, obviously impact, uh, you know, your clients directly, of course. Absolutely. Um, yeah, but yeah, throw it to you. Well, I've um, jotted down a few um, names, and that is uh, Donnarumma, Hizai, Alaba, Ramos, and Garcia, Vinaldo, Chalanoglu, Sovan, and Depay, Depay, Aguero, and Messi. This is not a very fortunate round of fantasy football. It's not my fantasy football team, <laughs> but it is the... Uh, players who went on a free transfer last summer. Mm. Uh, this is absolutely incredible, an aggregate value of <laughs> possibly around half a billion uh, euros. And they all went, they, they're by no means uh, old, play, old players. You know, you've got Donnarumma, who's 22. Uh, you have Messi, who's ageless. And... Uh, but, but that is, uh, this shows that this is a real shift towards player power and agent power. Mm. So this is something that we um, in the industry are going to, you're very aware of this issue and that everybody involved in this industry. I'm not saying that it's particularly, I'm, uh, I'm neutral about this. I'm not saying that it's uh, mm. b a bad thing or a good thing. I'm just saying that uh, we need, this is a force to be reckoned with. Uh, the fact that um, this might impact uh, the uh, industry in a way that uh, we might not necessarily uh, expect at the moment. Uh, so it will impact the relationship within, between players and clubs, uh, the way clubs do their uh, transfer policy, uh, the type of the length of contract, uh, investment in academy rather than, you know, other formulas that they could use to uh, uh, try and keep their talent mm. uh, in. Um, less transfers in, it, it also means uh, more uh, 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 stability and the balance of powers, etc. And then, um, again, the role of the agent. As uh, Emilio was uh, uh, saying earlier, this has been in the cards for quite some time now. It will be uh, approved. I see that you have uh, already provided for uh, an agent chamber even before the regulations are well, so you mean business, uh, obviously, and that I see also that the football tribunal has uh, powers to sanction uh, the individuals, um, and, um, and this is very important. What is interesting and will be a challenge for the future is the interplay between the FIFA agents regulations and the national agents regulations. Um, uh, agent regulations, for example, in France or, or in Italy, Italy is a perfect example, is regulated by uh, the, the, uh, the national law. And uh, does this supersede uh, the FIFA regulations? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know how I feel about this. And I, what remains to be seen is how the legislator in Italy will, uh, uh, will, will see this. Um, or systems that actually work really well, like in uh, England. Um, Italy is over-regulated. Mm -hmm. uh, they have two separate, the, the uh, FIGC and the Italian NOC, the CONI. So you have to be registered with both in, in Italy. Um, in England, you don't need to, but uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, when it comes to the transactions, um, uh, England has a clearing house, for example, or Rule K arbitration, and it's very well regulated. How are these countries going to receive uh, the FIFA uh, regulations? Mm -hmm. What will uh, change in countries where things work very well or not so well? 
So this, yeah. I, I'm just asking questions really mm -hmm. uh, about about the future. We don't uh, know the answer. Uh, financial for play is another one of of yeah. It's not probably the <laughs> this is the right forum to uh, talk about this, but uh, obviously it's failed to deliver on so many levels. Uh, financial for play. They're already talking about uh, imposing a. Uh, luxury tax and because uh, the competitive balance has not improved has it mm -hmm. uh, uh, if if anything else if nothing else it has um, got worse um the, the the reform on the loan loan system that is uh, another uh, point that might impact at least our work uh, uh, dramatically um again we work with clubs that use loans uh, very generously but especially with um, an obligation to purchase a player. Um, what, how is the um, possible potential prohibition uh, uh, on, on uh, above a certain number of loans going to impact mm. the policy um, of, of the clubs? How is FIFA going to look into formulas like buyback options? You know, if you can't uh, you loan a player or, or you can transfer a player permanently and then you have a buyback, a recompra, no? uh, which could be used at, I'm not saying to circumvent, but, you know. We're, <laughs> we're, we're, taking, we're taking notes. Yeah, we're taking notes. Huh? Exactly. Yeah. So that, this, is, this is some of the, 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 the ideas for the future, that I, the, the questions that I have for the future. And finally, mm -hmm. COVID. COVID has impacted our economy worldwide in a way that uh, I think World War II hasn't. I mean, we're still paying the debt for of, of, of the last uh, two wars, and now uh, and, and now COVID. Um, clubs have been impacted dramatically. Not only our clients, but you know, uh, mm -hmm. worldwide. Uh, uh, I, I think Barcelona. Uh, uh, Inter Milan in Italy, um, uh, Arsenal. I have um, um, here that uh, a quick look at Companies House show, um, shows that the increase in clubs in England using uh, the Australian bank Macquarie, uh, mm -hmm. for example, for factoring uh, operations to, to get money uh, in advance. Um, and other issues that uh, um, COVID has brought with itself, um, the effect of which we could we will only uh, see in the future. And finally, of course, the um, the clearing house mm. and the uh, interplay with uh, with the regulations and the dispute resolution system. A lot on the play plate. I have no answers. I've got a lot of questions though. Well, I don't know about you, Emilio, but I'm not sleeping tonight uh, after, <laughs> after that one. But no, thanks, Paolo. I think there's a lot of uh, interesting things there and, and questions uh, there for us as well. We might touch on that in a second, but Rafael, I give you the floor as well. I mean, the, what challenges you've seen that the program that FIFA wants to introduce in the next uh, three or four years, what do you think is, is going to be the biggest issues that, that we're going to face? Yeah, I think that there is this will now to um, to clean the system a bit, like uh, Emilio said, and uh, of course the club will uh, will comply, but will also and other actors uh, because, as we have said, it's not only about the club; it's also about the the players themselves, the families, the agents, all these actors uh, around the transfer system. Will they uh, try to circumvent in certain ways uh, the rules? Uh, we have spoken about the loans, of course, but even about the money and the commission fees, for example, the 10% cap on agents. Uh, I was a bit uh, like surprised when this cap was implemented uh, or suggested because it will uh, came into force. Uh, it didn't come yet to, into force, but it will uh, probably soon. Uh, as it was voted by the council. Uh, so, for example, I was like saying, OK, but this legitimates the way of uh, taking money out of the transfer from the agents, uh, even though in principle it's the agents should, of course, advise the player rather than the club. But then, of course, they can claim they uh, advise the club and uh, we can say 10 percent. It's already a lot. But then I spoke to football officials and they say that for us is, is a good, is a good uh, measure because at least we can say them it's only 10%. 
because now they ask even more in many cases. So you see the difficulty. If there is this mentality for an agent or even for a player on a personal basis, it's family to say, okay, but uh, I want uh, 50%. Uh, and it happens, these things happen. So we, we tried, FIFA tried and banned the TPO, but now I saw a Brazilian team issuing tokens with a blockchain uh, technology in exchange of the future transfer of players. So is it TPO? Is not paid directly, but is a token. So you will see this kind of initiatives to circumvent all the system because there is this mentality, the money is there and, uh, and the principle of the tra transfer system are not understood by all the actors in the same way. And uh, now, uh, of course, they, they, they earn a lot of money. We have seen the figures. We speak about agents, but are not only agents uh, in the market uh, for sure. Uh, Will they comply that easily and say, okay, we are happy now with the 10% or I'm not sure. So they will try to, uh, to find other ways. And for that, the, the, I think there will be a, a lot of, uh, of compliance to be done, monitoring uh, the, a lot of cases, but it's a very good uh, thing, for example, to have an agent chamber, I think, because, uh, okay, we can say the agent, sometimes they take advantage of the system in an Indu and you, in, in, they are also involved in not very clean operation, etc. But at the same time, they play a role. They are, they are there. And many of them, especially the small ones, struggle sometimes to be recognized also for their work by their players or the clubs or bigger agents also uh, not uh, respecting uh, their, their own role. So, uh, from that perspective, I think uh, there will be that the challenge will be that I think there will be many cases, many disputes, but because the system is not working properly, but at the same time is a good challenge because it is the role again of FIFA to, to, to have an idea and FIFA will give himself the means to know more what, happen, what happens in the market. And Emilio said probably he, he hopes the last... Uh, last uh, measure uh, in, in this package of reforms, but uh, all is evolving so fast also with the new technologies, uh, etc. I am sure that uh, we will speak again about new reforms in a few years, mm -hmm. not because perhaps these ones were not well conceived, it's just because things change and then you discover, you find out ways of circumventing and you will be obliged always to, mm. to innovate, to find new solution. And this, uh, I, I expect this kind of development. No, grazie, Raffaele. And this is the fun part where these guys don't actually know the next questions that I'm going to ask. So, Raffaele, you actually touched on something that I wanted to ask you. Um, cryptocurrency, tokens, NFTs, we're starting to see them now come into... Uh, come into football, what is your prediction for the future uh, for these types of, as you just described, new technologies? Yeah, in, in terms of player transfer, it's already a reality. Fluminense uh, issued these tokens to, to deal with new transfers. So, of course, if you don't say to stop it directly and to say this is illegal, then others will follow because there is a lot of interest, especially by the young generation again, uh, there are a lot of investment we have seen for Messi also the transfer uh, was uh, was partially financed uh, with uh, with a cryptocurrency the cryptocurrencies are now uh, sponsoring more and more clubs they have clearly identified football as a good vehicle uh, for for promoting themselves and of course uh, to uh, to create a new business and I'm sure they will, uh, there will be an appetite because uh, there is real money uh, behind the transfer of all of these to enter this market. And they are slowly by slowly associating themselves to clubs already uh, entering the market. And of course, this will be uh, also a, an issue to be, de to be dealt because uh, it won't stop like this. On the contrary, I see more kind of development, the association of uh, the cryptocurrency business and the, 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 the transfer market. And beyond, of course, it can be TV rights, other 
other uh, receivables of the clubs converted mm. in cryptocurrencies with a certain exchange rate, etc. So it's for sure a, a hot topic also, I think. I'm sure we'll be talking about it again uh, in a few years, next year, next week. Indeed. Paolo, if you could uh, change one thing about the FIFA transfer system and the regulations, just one thing, what would it be? Wow. Um, that's so, solo owner, one thing. Solo owner, mm. that thing, exactly. <laughs> How much time do I have? <laughs> um, that slide about the uh, balance between uh, the gap between uh, agent fees and uh, um, uh, training uh, rewards. Interesting. Okay. And Emilio, I actually open the floor to you. Uh, last words. Do you have anything else to say about uh, the transfer system or, or the direction we're looking at going into the future? No, nothing else. I think that we have already mm. explained more or less the basis of, of the system. Uh, just expect that we, we all work together with the clubs, with the leagues, with the confederations, and we can finish this third reform package, final and third. Mm. will not be the final one for sure, but at least uh, we need six months, one year to, to, to be a little bit more relaxed with the transfer system. But we, the, the idea is, again, the next uh, 12, 18 months, we, we finish with the third reform package, mm. and then we do all the things. Gracias. Thank you, Emilio. Gracias. I think uh, opportunity now to open to the floor uh, and there go the hands. But I, I, I will be, I think, uh, Pierre Lanfranchi, I would like to offer him the first question if it's okay. He's been wanting to ask the whole time I've seen him very, with very the hands. Very short one. Yeah. About morality. One of the main problems that was seen from the side of uh, humanities, from the side of other fields, has been how difficult the system of transfer has been seen in the last decade regarding how to, to know what kind of money has been put into transfers with mm -hmm. the tokens free new models, which is about the roles of states as regulatory. What is the place of the normal, normal trade and business inside the football business? Do you say it's a normal business at the moment, or is it something very strange and different? Emilio, I'm going to pass that to you. <laughs> I would say that it's a very particular market, yeah, you are right. <laughs> um, it's a particular market. Um, what can I say? <laughs> I've been involved in football since uh, 70 years ago. No, we, we know each other since a long time ago. It's, it's very particular. So looking at the figures that James is playing in, in the beginning, no, moving from 2 billion to 8 billion. Wow. So this is amazing. No, It attracts a lot of problems. So there are millions and millions flying around. And, and this is one of our key challenges, no? trying to put some integrity, compliance, morality into the system. No? But it's difficult because we see transfers from Canada, Vancouver to Adelaide, no? and from Japan to South Africa, different cultures, different backgrounds. So, you know, thanks to football, thanks to FIFA, WAF and the Spanish FA and CIS, uh, I've been uh, traveling uh, all around the world no? since 20 years ago. And one of the things that I, I like to highlight is, you know, what is completely normal in Switzerland is absolutely abnormal in Buenos Aires or completely different in Canada. So, you know, so I'm not a fan of this, you know, closed system. No, this is the truth. This is the reality. And this is what we want to implement. No, The world is so different that, uh, you know, we need to be careful. But of course, some standards must be uh, uh, applied in a complex uh, uh, market like football, yeah. Hello there. Um, my name is Gonzalo Almeida. I'm a student from the first edition and a sports lawyer since 2001. Now, I don't want to sound... Uh, flatterer, but um, I actually don't have a specific question, but I just want to say that throughout these 20 years, 
and throughout all these administrations from FIFA, um, things have evolved tremendously in a positive manner. Um, from a legal perspective, um, procedures are much swifter. Uh, there's communication directly with FIFA. There's transparency. In the old days, if a lawyer or anyone would like to communicate with player status, but I've worked for nearly five years, you would need to know someone or you would need to file an appeal before CAS. And a lot of things have improved positively. And when I look at the clearing house, I see it as a, a daredevil project. Um, it's really, really um, exciting, but um, according to my experience, there's still a lot of things to do at the level of the member associations. For instance, quite recently, I had to instruct to train actually as a sports lawyer, not working for this uh, major African MA, how to deliver a player's passport. And this is a, quite challenging when we're thinking about implementing this project next year. Um, it is challenging. Uh, it's worth to be challenging because definitely it's going to change the, the picture dramatic, I wouldn't say dramatically, I say drastically in a positive manner. So basically I would like to congratulate you because uh, indeed for the last five to six years, things have changed very positively for everyone, including for us as sports lawyer, uh, sports lawyers uh, and everyone integrating football family. Thanks. One last question, yeah. You will answer? Or? What, what, what can I say? Thank okay. you very much for your comments. <laughs> so it's, it's the first thing that, uh, you know, I heard positive comments about FIFA, no? So, you know, I'm adapted the, my time at the Spanish FA, UEFA and FIFA. When you are the regulator, you know, you are always responsible, liable for everything. So, you know, either you are right, wrong. So the regulator is always responsible. So these comments are more than welcome. Obrigado. <laughs> Uh, hello, guys. Uh, my name is Ali Kater. I was been in 17th edition. Uh, I was the ex sport director of one of the biggest clubs in Asia and working uh, in the transfer market uh, just like a second by second and having the RSTP like a Bible in my hand every time. But there are a lot of things that, uh, since Emilio, that you entered in the FIFA, a lot of things has evolved that I can just see this and uh, the regulations, uh, the way of the process and proceeding the case in the DRC has been uh, changed in a really good way. But there's still a lot of things that uh, it's need to, to change in, in RSTP because uh, most of the BIS article that you guys added in the regulation is more in the club favor and due to pressure from the big stakeholder like FIFPRO that you enters that. Imagine that you have the case that 90% of the case in the FIFA DRC that the player will win the case, but 90% the club will lose. This is not that we have the bad lawyer or the good lawyer. This is because of the regulation more in favor of the player. For example, uh, Article 14 bis for outstanding payments. If you don't pay to the player or the coach for two months, the coach can cancel his contract in one way and sitting in his home for two years, three years, and just getting the money. One day after that's finishing that these two, three years, the contracts, he will get the job suddenly. He never try to get the job due to support of the regulation of the FIFA. But this killing the club, especially in my country like Iran, that, you know, that we had a lot of cases. James know this because he sometimes works with lots of the case in Iran. That's, and due to this kind of the regulation, the club in the countries like Iran, like Turkey, that they will die very soon. Because, you know, that's sometimes they know the regulations. 
sometimes they cannot transfer the money to the coach because I would just give the example. Uh, in Iran, we cannot uh, transfer the money uh, legally to the client outside the country. And okay, we just put the clause in the in the contracts. The player, the coach will accept the cash. The coach came in the country, two, three months he accept the cash, and suddenly after two, three months, he just had an argument with the, with the club manager. He never accept the cash. We cannot force the guy giving the cash to the coach, please accept this. He will not get it. Just send him my account. We cannot send this account. After two months, he will cancel his contracts. He will get for three, four years money. When FIFA will give award very easily. We thought even, you know, that's no defense, no any defense will be accepted by FIFA DRC judge. This kind of the problem that we have in, in our country and also in other countries. And we should just think, Emilio, for, for this kind of the BIS article that you added. I know that due to pressure from the FIFA, a strong stakeholder that you put it, okay, just only copy paste the Swiss law only in the in the FIFA regulation. This doesn't help the football. And yeah, the other question maybe that's, you ask for the bank account information for your clearing house. But in Iran, no club can open official bank account. How they can just, you know, that's get their training compensation. They started the payments for that because this is obligatory. Every club, they should just have bank account information with the name of the club. And we have this kind of the problem. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for the two questions. I think that they are very, very interesting. Um, I'm very well aware of the situation in Iran. Fortunately, unfortunately, I'm also the chief compliance officer of FIFA. And we are facing a lot of problems with your country due to what we know. Um, and, and you are right, this is a very challenging issue for a company, an association like FIFA, no? because we are developing football and you cannot believe what I can tell you concerning Iran or North Korea. So just sending balls or even CDs or, you know, it's, it's really critical. But of course, there are some rules that uh, we have to comply with and, and we need to be careful. But yeah, I'm, I'm aware of this situation. Uh, when it comes to the first question, what can I say? Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the RSTP is not, uh, uh, for me, these are not re regulations anymore. So this, this is a pure CBA, a collective bargaining agreement. So this is the outcome of the discussions between clubs, European clubs, South American clubs, African clubs, leagues coming from all around the world, MAs, confederations, FIPRO, obviously, and FIFA. So it's not FIFA deciding, well, you know, we would like to uh, uh, balance this in favor of players. So this was a consensus decision taken by all these clubs. In any case, I tell you, this is not the Swiss system. So if you go to my country, your country, your country, your country, so, you know, I think, and we have Rafael Poli, and we can uh, ask him to prepare for free uh, evaluation of this uh, data. So in all jurisdictions all across the world, employees have more rights, have more chances to win the case in a labor court than the employer. So it's not the FIFA system or the Swiss system. I think that is all around the world. So I've been a, a, a lawyer for a quite time, for, for time in Spain on employment matters. And you know, if you are going, my first case was representing the employer. I don't need to tell you the outcome. <laughs> so, you know, so that's that's not the, you know, so, you know even though the employer has a fantastic lawyer, so you know, <laughs> uh, I'm very sorry. So, and it, this is not the Swiss system. This is the reality. And again, the, the, the new article 14 bis is the outcome of a uh, of, uh, decision of the groups and is there. So it's not trying to help players or clubs. It's trying to put a little bit of order uh, within the system. That's all. But, you know, both points are very, very interesting. So thank you very much. And the second, sorry, yes. The bank account registration. I told you in the beginning, yeah, I know that this is challenging in, in Iran, but it's not only in Iran. 
So we will be facing this situation in South America, in some countries. So we are in contact with the South American Federation uh, associations. They, 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 they can have the same problem also in Africa. So we are working on it in the context of the clearing house. Uh, but we are well aware of this, that, you know, Real Madrid or Manchester United, you know, these are big clubs, uh, but, uh, you know, a small club in Uruguay or uh, a big club in Iran can have problems with this. So we are working on it, even though we have different opinions about how to solve this, uh, uh, we will find a solution. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Emilio. I think uh, our time has finished now. So firstly, I would like everyone to say thank you to our guests. So thanks, Emilio, Paolo, Rafael. Um, and we've, and we've, we've taken all our notes on the FIFA side and we'll go back and throw them all into the mix. So thank you very much. And I think I pass back to, uh, to Denny. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>